The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shelby Fiegel, Director of the Center for Community and Economic Development at the University of Central Arkansas. And I'm so excited to have you join us for our Understanding the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, better known as the CARES Act, uh, and what that means for your community webinar today. Um, looking through our attendee list, we have an amazing group on the call for the webinar today. Um, we're really grateful for you taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us and for our partners at Retail Strategies for connecting with us to hold this training. At UCACCD, we work with communities and organizations all across the state of Arkansas and a variety of training and technical assistance projects. If you want to learn more about our work, and upcoming training events, please visit www.uca.edu cced. I do wanna make a note before we begin that we will be sending the slide deck from today's webinar, the recording and other COVID-19 resources out to all attendees. Um, so don't worry about that, we got you taken care of. So I wanna welcome Jen Gregory with Retail Strategies um, on the webinar today. She's gonna to be leading us through this training. Jen, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization um, as we get started? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much, Shelby, for having us today, and thank all of you for joining our webinar today. Um, as Shelby said, my name is Jen Gregory, and I'm the president of Downtown Strategies for our company, Retail Strategies. Retail Strategies is a retail recruitment and downtown revitalization consulting firm out of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I actually manage our Mississippi office, so I am uh, coming to you from a neighboring state, uh, coming to you from Starkville, Mississippi today. Um, our company represents municipalities, chambers, and economic development agencies really all over the country um, to help them understand their real estate, help them understand what national retailers they're missing, um, and really assist them with recruiting those businesses to their markets. Um, we also help communities really um, reimagine what their downtown and town centers can be by helping with strategic planning and design work. So today we're going to focus on um, the CARES Act and why it's important for cities, communities, uh, municipalities, chambers, economic development agencies, um, and really what you need to know as community leaders to unpack all of the different provisions within the CARES Act and how to share that with um, your own community, with businesses, with residents, and with other agencies in your community. So first, before we get into the specifics of the CARES Act, it's really important, I think, to kind of look back and think, how did we get here? Um, you know, it's shocking to me um, that our way of life has totally changed. I mean, it's no secret to all of us that businesses are, are tremendously struggling, that the economy looks completely different than it did this time last year, um, and that this, this thing just completely came out of nowhere and really um, completely transformed not only the way our businesses operate, but also how all of us approach everyday life. And it's shocking to me to think that this has only really been going on for about five months or so. Um, so just looking at a timeline of events and, and other provisions that Congress put into practice before the CARES Act, um, we can see that this really became known, or at least we all started hearing about this um, at the end of December of 2019. Um, China reported its first death from this unknown uh, respiratory virus, January 11th, and then other countries, including the United States, confirmed our first case, January 20th. Important for us to know today, the World Health Organization declared a global health emergency on January 30th, and then this virus got its name, COVID-19. The Trump administration first signed um, the first wave of funding from Congress for $1.25 billion. And this is really for coronavirus research and testing. Um, we were hoping, and I think lawmakers specifically were hoping that um, a, a vaccine could be developed quickly um, and that cities and states could help mitigate the danger from this um, with a lot less effort than it actually took. Travel restrictions were put into place February 29th, specifically to China. Um, another phase of funding came from Congress to develop even more widespread testing as that became evident 
that they that we were very short and and did not really match up compared to other countries throughout the world. And then also important to our purposes here today, on March 13th, President Trump declared a national emergency, which really unlocked a lot of funding for small businesses in particular. Social distancing became um, discussed and really gatherings no more than 50 people or more were discussed in mid-March. And then, of course, that quickly went down um, to no more than 10. Um, we saw huge events worldwide be delayed or canceled, Wimbledon and, and the Olympics, and even countries like India that have an immense population took extreme measures to lock down their population. Uh, President Trump signed what has been thus far the largest bill ever passed by the United States Congress on March 27th, and that was the $2.2 trillion stimulus package known as the CARES Act. And we'll obviously get into detail about that today. Um, this act was really aimed towards everyday Americans, small businesses, um, and then large institutions that really contribute to national security. After the CARES Act was passed, there have been additional measures that Congress has put into play um, and the Federal Reserve. So on April 9th, the Fed announced $2.3 trillion in loans um, that would be available to small businesses, municipalities, um, and other businesses. And we're not going to get into too much um, detail of this today because primarily, as it relates to municipalities, um, really only a population of 500,000 or more are eligible for this municipal liquidity facility. Uh, but just know and did want to mention that uh, there, there really are a tremendous amount of loans that the Fed is, is pushing forward, and we even heard some more about that in the news today. And then finally, on April 24th, President Trump signed a $484 billion bill that replenished the CARES Act and really the Paycheck Protection Program which we'll get into detail today. Um, so a lot has happened in a short period of time. I think all of us have probably just been stunned with uh, you know, the way of the world today. But um, the good news is Congress did step in. They did provide immediate relief. Um, something that I'm probably going to mention a number of times today is that while this was early on called a stimulus bill, um, it's really that's been walked back a little bit. And now, you know, it's, it's evident that the CARES Act um, is more of a relief bill. Um, the, the goal of it, and I think lawmakers and the president, um, the goal of this bill and this funding was really to stop the bleeding, if you will. So to help Americans stay in their homes, pay their bills, keep food on the table for their families when clearly there have been a tremendous amount of unemployment um, really widespread throughout the country. So um, I do believe, and we'll get into this in a little bit later in the presentation, I definitely do believe that there will be a stimulus package that will come out later. Um, but as of right now, this is really a relief, a relief package um, to help businesses, to help Americans, and, and just to help people from losing their homes, uh, to be quite honest. So there have been three phases of congressional relief that have been passed thus far. And the last point on the timeline that I mentioned was a replenishment um, of the Paycheck Protection Program. That's not really being classified as a fourth phase of funding, uh, but there are talks of a fourth phase of congressional relief. As of right now, there have been three. The first, um, the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act, which was geared towards vaccine research and development. Again, as I mentioned, uh, I think people, you know, really thought and lawmakers thought that this could be controlled a lot quicker than it was. Um, so that appropriation was, was really geared towards health care. The second appropriation signed on March 18th, the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act, was focused on paid sick leave and unemployment benefits. And then, of course, just a short term later, the CARES Act, which um, really, in an unprecedented way, expanded those unemployment benefits. Um, and provided relief to families and businesses. So we've said that this is a big bill. How does the CARES Act really measure up? Well, it equals 10% of the American GDP right now, and it is twice the size of the largest bill ever signed by Congress, which was President Obama's American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. And at that time, it was 5.7% of GDP. So this is a magnificent bill. It is of unprecedented proportion, 
But I think what we have all learned is that it's not enough. Um, the package is $100 billion short of a request from the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which is important for our audience here today. I think we have all realized thus far that there are provisions that will help businesses in our small towns, but in terms of recouping lost sales tax revenue, there is no provision for that thus far. And the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National League of Cities, among others, have been lobbying hard for that because they know and we know uh, that city budgets are definitely seeing shortfalls compared to where they were this time last year. And ultimately, the policy response is going to guide this. You know, how long um, America is shut down um, will really guide how the economy responds. And we're seeing many states, certainly many states here in the South are starting to open up, but at minimal capacity. So we'll be watching all of that to see how cities really respond to that. Also looking at how it measures up, you can see that these are the top provisions that lawmakers focused on when assembling the CARES Act. So the top four are really the ones that we are gonna focus on today. Um, corporate loans, small business loans, household payments, and unemployment insurance. You can see those are the priorities of lawmakers and that's where the majority of funds were allocated. And so today we will focus on this, these provisions and definitely there are a multitude of other provisions that we won't have time to get into today. If you do have any questions about those or if there's something that you were hoping to learn today but you didn't hear, please feel free to reach out to Shelby or myself um, and we can definitely help you through those. Also, you'll notice on the right-hand side of your screen in the control panel that there is a question box. Um, please feel free to expand that box and type in your questions at any point. We will answer all questions at the end of this presentation, but you definitely won't disturb the broadcast by entering those questions as you think of them. So feel free to do that throughout this presentation. So these are the four provisions that we're gonna focus on today. Direct payments to everyday Americans, opportunities for cities and states, small business relief, and unemployment benefits. So jumping right into the direct payments to everyday Americans, probably many of you on the call today have received some type of what people are really referring to as a stimulus check, even though I'll remind all of us that it, it you know, it's being called a rebate and more of a relief check. Um, we do believe that a stimulus package will be coming later. Um, if you haven't received your check, if you're wondering why you didn't get one, um, these are the parameters and this could tell you what you need to do to get your check or why you didn't receive one. So U.S. residents with a gross income um, of up to $75,000 for a single person or $150,000 for a married couple who are not a dependent of another taxpayer and have a social security number are eligible for the full rebate, which is $1,200 per person or $2,400 per couple. There is a rebate per child of $500. Um, however, and we'll get into this on the next slide a little bit, but there is an age restriction. Um, but given that your children are under the age of 16, you will receive $500 per child, and there is no limit to how many children um, can be included in that. So what do you need to do to get your check? Well, if you haven't already gotten one um, and you have filed taxes in either 2018 or 2019, um, you don't really have to take any action. You don't have to request this, um, but there is an IRS portal. You can see that address is bolded irs.gov slash coronavirus slash economic impact payment, where you can check the status of your check essentially. Um, if, it, you, if there's a message that says status unknown, um, or you know, kind of a cryptic message like that, then either you don't qualify or the IRS just hasn't processed yours yet. They are still processing checks, so if you haven't gotten one and you think that you meet the criteria, don't worry, you likely will be receiving yours. What we have learned is that individuals that had already filed their 2019 taxes um, were actually at a little bit of a disadvantage because those tax returns had to be reviewed and process, whereas the 2018 returns have already been processed. Those that received their payments the quickest were those that have banking information on file with the IRS. So again, if you think you meet that criteria and haven't received your check, 
You can also go to that website and if you are eligible, but the IRS does not have your checking account information, you have the opportunity to enter it in for direct deposit. Otherwise, you'll be receiving a paper check. The amount of these rebate checks is phased out for single filers with incomes exceeding $99,000. So if you are, you know, file taxes single, or if you are single, but make nine, over $99,000, you won't receive any type of rebate. But anywhere between $75,000 and $99,000, there is a sliding scale. Also, if you're a single parent with a child and you file head of household, your threshold and for a married couple, $198,000. So who won't receive a check? Well, again, we mentioned those income thresholds, but also your dependent children over the age of 16 um, will not be qualified for that $500 rebate. So if you have you know, a 17-year-old child that's still in the home with you, um, that is a dependent on your taxes, unfortunately, um, there is no rebate for them, also dependent adults. So if, for example, you have um, an elderly parent that you file on your taxes as a dependent of yours, you will not be eligible for a rebate for them either. And then lastly, if you don't have a social security number, or if you file married and join, and one of the people in the household, is one of the, the couple, <clears throat> excuse me, does not have a social security number, then neither will be eligible for this rebate payment. Um, you know, again, we are looking for potentially additional funds to come later, um, and we'll get into where Congress is with the fourth phase of funding right now, but as of now, that is what has been slated to be provided to Americans um, as part of the CARES Act. The second category of what we'll discuss today are opportunities for cities and states. And as we mentioned, you know, definitely um, there's an overwhelming missing part of the CARES Act for cities um, that are smaller than a population of 500,000. Every state in the nation, regardless of population, will receive an appropriation of at least $1.25 billion. There was an, a total appropriation of $150 billion um, that was set aside for states and localities that has to specifically be used for expenditures related to the response to COVID. We'll get into those specifications in just a moment, but regarding population, um, those larger, larger states and more densely populated states like California, Texas, Florida, they will receive more than $1.25 billion, just depending on their population rates. But localities, and that's a county, municipality, town, township, village, parish, borough, or any other unit of government, including tribal governments, um, do have to have a population that exceeds 500,000 people to be eligible for direct payment. Now, the state, all states do have the opportunity and the availability to share their $1.25 billion or whatever it is that the amount that they receive with smaller localities in their state, but that's completely up to them. They're not required to do that. And both for the state and any locality that receives either direct payment or that receives trickle down payment from the state. The expenditures that these appropriations are eligible for have to be incurred due to COVID-19. And those expenditures cannot have been accounted for in the most current budget of the locality. And those expenditures have to occur between March 1st and December 30th of this year. So basically, um, a lot of localities and a lot of states are saying, you know, that's not really what I need money for. What I really need money for is to help me recoup what I've lost by hotels, um, you know, restaurants, businesses, beaches, mountains, whatnot being closed to the public and so that lost sales tax revenue. So far, there's no specific provision for that. However, there are other provisions that are not directly uh, appropriated to cities and states, but that are eligible. So, for example, there's a lending fund 
of about $500 billion that cities and states are eligible for. It is to help mitigate losses incurred as a result of the coronavirus, but it is not grant money, it is a loan. And so um, the debt service has to be there to be able to pay the money back. And there is a lot of concern for cities um, as it relates to that right now. Also FEMA received $45 billion to help cities and states um, you know, respond to this disaster. Um, there has been appropriations for um, transit, and so we'll get into the specifics of transit, but transit infrastructure grants, as well as election security grants. Um, the federal government has provided $400 million to ensure safe and fair elections in this federal election cycle. However, most recently, um, the, the congressional Democrats have estimated that over $1.3 billion is going to be required in their estimates to really ensure safe and fair elections. So again, we do think more money will be coming for that, but as of right now, that's what's been appropriated. There are also um, eligible funds for local law enforcement um, through this specific Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program, and of course, assistance for airports um, to really help them mitigate um, the, the new safety measures that they are having to implement to keep um, travelers safe. Um, we have gotten a lot of questions here at Retail Strategies about CDBG grants. So I'm gonna get into those in, in more detail in just a moment because they are really geared towards health and human services, but we'll break down those in just a moment. Um, also through the Department of Commerce, there is $1.5 billion through the Economic Development Administration um, this is really primarily geared towards manufacturing, but we have seen also the availability of these funds to go to tourism, but primarily private businesses um, that are specifically related to tourism. Um, so not your CVBs or your local tourism agencies, unfortunately. Um, additionally, we've seen $50 million um, for manufacturing for those small and medium-sized manufacturers to really help reboost the supply chain and get people back to work. As I mentioned, there are a variety of funds being appropriated through the SPA, um, directly through the CARES Act. You can see kind of the formula um, and how that money is being appropriated throughout. Um, the funding is available for operating expenses of transit agencies related to the response um, to COVID-19. So what we're hearing is that for this, um, those restrictions aren't quite as severe or as um, strenuous, if you will, to keep it related to COVID. You can see some of the eligible expenses, um, you know, purchase of personal protective equipment, and paying administrative leave of operations personnel due to reduction in services. We even had somebody in um, Idaho the other day tell us that their transit agency was able to use these funds to recoup lost revenue. So, um, you know, interestingly enough, even though this bill was passed at the end of March, um, there are many provisions that are still being trickled down and, and really um, specificity is just now coming out about how the money can be used. Um, circling back to CDBG funds, the Community Development Block Grant, um, there was a specific appropriation of $5 billion through HUD, Housing and Urban Development. This has already been appropriated, actually. And so if you're very interested in that, please email me. I do have a spreadsheet of where all of that money was appropriated. It was very, very quickly appropriated to existing agencies that provide services for senior citizens, the homeless, and public health services. Um, so this is really primarily geared toward um, helping the elderly or low income with meals, um, helping to be sure that those low income folks aren't displaced out of their homes, and with the homeless populations, making sure that there are hand washing stations and, and shelters, not only to keep them safe throughout this, but also to really mitigate the spread of this virus. And then lastly, the Department of Agriculture did receive a healthy appropriation. And one that I want to point out specifically today is that $9.5 billion of the total allocation um, was for farmers that directly supply schools, farmers markets, and restaurants 
with food or um, meat. So if you are a community leader and you have a farmer's market in your community, I would highly recommend you to make contact with your state Department of Ag, find out what they have received, um, because what we're learning is that the majority of these federal appropriations are being trickled down through the state agencies, which are then appropriating them to their more local agencies. So um, we definitely believe that there is eligibility for funding for, for farmers that supply directly to farmers markets. And if you can be a conduit of that, then that certainly does help your market grow and also your culinary scene in your community. And then the final provision that we'll look at today um, is the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, and final provision for directly for cities and states, that is. So the National Endowment for the Arts is awarded $75 million in funds. Um, and they have already put out um, the way that they will disperse these funds. So again, the National Endowment is distributing these to the state arts commissions who have then developed grant procedures. And many states have already opened up applications for these grant funds for art initiatives within communities. So if you have an arts commission in your community that you work closely with, we certainly recommend um, that they check with their state art commission to see what funding is available that your locality may be eligible for. Just a reminder as we transition here that if you do have any questions, um, feel free to drop those in the question box. I'm already seeing a couple come through and we will get to these at the end of the presentation. Um, so the next one provision that we're going to discuss, and this is really where we have received the majority of um, our questions here at Retail Strategies, and that is for small businesses. Um, you know, I actually did some research yesterday for a partner of ours and discovered that small businesses make up 44% of our nation's economy, um, and two-thirds of net new jobs are created by small businesses. So um, I think it's evident that small businesses not only make up the, the real creative fabric of each of our communities, um, but they also are um, extremely important to the economic perspective of our communities, states, and on a federal level. So the federal government is supporting small businesses through a variety of ways. And so, you know, before I get into this, what I'm going to mention is that we are going to go through these programs, but I think it's been no secret, <laughs> definitely if you've watched the news or, or read the Wall Street Journal or anything, that there's been a lot of criticism about the rollout of the, the Paycheck Protection Program, how some publicly traded companies have unfairly benefited by these programs. So we will address that. Um, at the end of this section, I am going to go through all of the specific provisions and how they can be applied for. But then at the end, we'll talk about what the current status is of this program and what it really means for small businesses today. So the federal government is supporting small businesses through a variety of ways. So prior to the CARES Act being passed, um, there, the Small Business Association launched the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Assistance Program. And so we'll refer to that today as the EIDL. Um, that, we will get into this specifically, but this, this loan program um, is, is less of a forgivable loan and more as operating cash that small businesses can borrow at a very low interest rate to help them through this tough time. Secondly, the CARES Act created a new program called the Paycheck Protection Program, um, which authorized $350 billion of federally guaranteed loans to qualifying small businesses, with a large percentage of that money being available uh, to be forgiven over a period of time. Backing up a little bit, the EIDL can be applied for through the Small Business Association whereas the Paycheck Protection Program is all through your local bank and your local lender. There's been a lot of um, you know, news content about these lenders, and we'll cover a little bit of that in just a moment, but want to be sure to remind you that EIDL is through the Small Business Association, Paycheck Protection Program is through your local bank, and mentioned that the Paycheck Protection Program does have an availability for forgiven funds, However, the, the forgiven funds can only be used for payroll expenses, such as employee salaries, paid sick or medical leave, 
insurance premiums and mortgage rent and utility payments. And we are hearing that the government is going to be checking up on recipients to be sure that the money was used for the intent, um, for the, the way that it was intended. So definitely take note of that, um, and, and we'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment. So let's get into the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. So again, this is to provide really working capital loans of up to $2 million for small businesses. Um, nonprofits are eligible to apply for EIDL loans, um, and these interest rates are very, very low. Um, also, the availability of these loans has been expanded a little bit and no longer requires a personal guarantee, which was something that was previously required by the SBA. And these are 30 year loans. So again, keeping in mind, this is working capital, really operating funds to help get everyone through. There was mention of an EIDL grant in the CARES Act. So there was a lot of excitement about this, that in addition to the loans that we spoke of, that small businesses would be eligible for up to $10,000 in emergency cash, basically, that would be eligible within three days of the business's application of funds. Um, there were specifications of what this could be used for, primarily payroll and sick leave, basically just to get their employees paid for the next couple of days to keep the doors open, to pay, make their rent payment and mortgage payment and whatnot. However, the reality is that that has not really happened. Um, and what we're learning is that many small business association chapters are walking that back a little bit and saying, Either A, we don't have the funds to do that, we're dedicating all of our money for paycheck protection and EIDL loans, or that this $10,000 grant money um, is restricted to $1,000 per employee. Also, the notion that this money would be available within three days has just across the board not been the case. Um, many times it's been a minimum of seven days. Sometimes people have applied and just not heard anything back for weeks. So we're not going to focus too much on that today because we don't really believe that, that there is still a, a good path forward for that. But the EIDL is a great, a great loan program, and the EIDL and the Paycheck Protection Program can be used hand in hand. Um, however, the money, the forgiven money, um, you know, does have to go to payroll. This EIDL money can be used for other things. You just can't double dip, basically. So now transitioning over to the Paycheck Protection Program. As a reminder, this is through your bank, so through your local lender. So who qualifies for this? Well, a business with less than 500 employees, independently owned franchises with less than 500 employees, and for the first time really ever, sole proprietors, independent contractors, and the self-employed are eligible for this, for this loan or grant funds and additionally are eligible for unemployment benefits, which we'll discuss in just a moment. For this program, the Paycheck Protection Program, only 501c3 nonprofits are eligible. There has been discussion with the fourth phase of funding to expand that to other nonprofits, but as it is, as it stands now, only 501c3 nonprofits are eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program. And importantly, um, the business has to have been in business since February 15th and has to have paid taxes on their employees or independent contractors. So how much is available? Well, it's a pretty simple formula and we'll show you a table on the next slide, but essentially 2.5 times the average monthly payroll for the previous year up to $10 million is eligible. Also, um, as we mentioned, that these funds are fully guaranteed by the federal government the proceeds, meaning the, the, the free money, if you will, the grant money, the forgiven funds, can only be used to cover payroll, rent, utilities, and interest expense. Um, the forgiveness, so the forgivable funds, are not taxable, you know, which is important. However, we've recently learned that whereas the forgivable loan proceeds are not taxable, the um, payroll that you pay on your employees is not tax deductible. So basically, while you're not taxed on this grant money, you can't write off um, the payroll expenses 
if you use the forgivable funds to cover that, basically. Again, there's more discussion about that on the federal level, but the IRS did just come out with a ruling um, about a week and a half ago that did state that. So here's kind of a table of how to calculate the PPP loans. Um, in order to apply, business owners need to go to their lender. Um, the Small Business Association does have a tool on their website where you can go in and type in your zip code and they will list the lenders that are qualified through their 7A lending program, um, which is the, those are the only lenders that can provide this money. Also, as you've probably read a lot in the news, banks are prioritizing their customers first. Um, so if, if you have a small business yourself or if you have a small business in your community that you're trying to help, um, definitely recommend that the small business owner go to their own banker who they do their business with and who they have current and existing accounts or loans with. They will need to bring these resources or these, um, these, this list of documents rather. So their financials for the last three years, a payroll list, rent expense, and their utility bills. And this is the simple calculation. You take your monthly payroll plus these payroll related and operation related expenses and multiply it times 2.5 and that's how much you are eligible for so for an example a business with 20 employees that has these specific costs multiplied by 2.5 they're eligible for $162,000 what is not eligible to be considered as payroll costs or that forgivable portion of the loan well, if you have an employee who has an annual salary of over $100,000, um, then the forgivable portion cannot cover that employee's salary. Additionally, the employees that are covered by this, um, their, their salaries or wages, that individual has to reside in the United States and any qualified sick or family medical leave where credit has already been used under the Coronavirus Relief Act cannot be covered by these costs. So basically, again, government trying to be sure that businesses don't double dip in the system. As we mentioned, there is a very um, enticing part of the PPP, and that is a large percent can be forgiven if the business does not lay anyone off that these funds are covering for four months. Now, as we get into the unemployment section, we'll talk about how this has presented problems for small businesses, um, but those are the requirements. If you have a small business or know someone in your community and they receive PPP money, but their employees quit on their own accord, the business owner either needs to plan on paying that portion back over a period of time, or they need to just go ahead and return it back to the SBA. Um, because they, that part will not be forgiven. Um, so the, the business owner needs to keep really close tabs on all of these things. Um, loan amounts that are not forgiven. So in the example that I just mentioned, um, one of the employees quits and you've already received uh, funding for their payroll. If you don't immediately pay it back, um, then it will be payable over a 10 year period at not more than a 4% interest rate. So it's still a relatively low amount and a, a, a decent amount of time to pay the funds back. So for some business owners that have had employees quit but just need the cash, um, that's fine. Just know that you, know, you will have to pay it back. And again, as I mentioned, these funds, the PPP, is applied for through your local lender. Um, that's part of the SBA 7A lending program. So check their website to double check. So what's the current status of PPP? Well, we read, we've read a lot about it in the news. There's been a lot of commentary. The first $350 billion that was appropriated via the CARES Act was claimed in 14 days. So really astonishing how much this funding was needed by the small business community. So on April 28th, as we mentioned, the $320 billion that was added to replenish the funds became available and when the money went live for that replenishment just the nation's five largest banks already had a million applications for over a hundred billion dollars ready to go in the queue all backlogged from previous applications so basically you know almost a third was already taken up just by the nation's five largest banks in applications that were not funded in the first wave 
Also, of the first phase, big corporations, so we're talking publicly traded companies, were able to secure nearly $600 million of the total allotment. So there was a lot of publicity about this. And ultimately, Treasury asked all publicly traded companies to return that funding, which included $20 million to Ruth's Chris, $10 million to Shake Shack, and 50 uh, that says billion, but that's actually a typo. That should be $50 million um, to hotel your Monty Bennett, who operates a number of hotels. And so you might ask, how was that possible? I thought this was capped at $10 million per applicant. And it was, but many of these large companies had um, subsidiaries or independent companies operating under them that all applied separately. So a lot of bad publicity, but the Treasury is trying to make that right. So moving on into unemployment benefits, we've talked about relief rebates to everyday Americans, we've talked about what is available and what is not available to cities and states, and we've talked about how small businesses can benefit from this. What about the unemployed? Obviously, there have been millions and millions of people who have lost their jobs, and so as a result of this, the CARES Act created the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Um, so, Beginning January 27th of this year through December 31st, there will be unemployment benefits paid to those types of workers that typically were ineligible for any type of benefit. So those include the self-employed, independent contractors, gig economy workers like Uber and Lyft drivers, and even those with limited work history. Uh, additionally, um, in addition to what the typical benefit would be from the state for those unemployed claims, the federal government is also providing an additional $600 per week to each recipient of unemployment insurance. So if we take what we learned from the small business section and compare that to this, it's easy to see that for many employees, especially those hourly employees, in hospitality type business or hospitality type jobs, they can make a lot more money through unemployment than they can by going back to work for their small business. Additionally, the Paycheck Protection Program only provides funding for really a 10 to 12 week period, um, whereas unemployment is guaranteed until December 31st. So there's been a lot of discussion about does this incentivize people to file for unemployment and to stay unemployed at the state and federal government's expense? Well, that's really not for us to discuss today. However, we have seen many small businesses um, really grapple with the fact that they can't keep their folks employed even with the Paycheck Protection Program funding. So a lot of different variables here, a lot to unpack. Um, and you know, we are seeing additionally this short-term compensation program where employers reduce employees' hours instead of laying them off, um, and, and there is a prorated unemployment benefit. So again, the government is trying to provide for the unemployed, um, but sometimes it's being noted that that might be at the expense of small businesses. So definitely a lot to unpack. Um, the unemployment benefits program also eliminates the seven-day waiting period for railroad unemployment insurance and gives the Secretary of Labor the ability to really speed up the ability of the Department of Labor to provide this benefit um, by waiving the Paperwork Reduction Act requirements. So the goal is to get people these benefits quickly. And as our company at Retail Strategies has talked to both the unemployed and small businesses, we're learning that you can get your money a whole lot quicker through the unemployment program than you can through the Patient Protection Program. And again, that money is guaranteed for a lot longer. So kind of a quandary that businesses are having to deal with, but nonetheless, these are the benefits that are available. So what's next? You know, I do want to, uh, want to mention that there is still funding available um, in the Paycheck Protection Program, um, whereas the first phase of funding went within 14 days. Many expected the, the replenishment to go even quicker, but that's really not the case. And as we watch the economy, um, we did just see the numbers, the sales tax revenue and industry retail numbers that came out for April. You know, I think the biggest test is going to be 
in July when the money runs out, when the paycheck protection money that has been allocated to these small businesses has been expended um, to see if these businesses can really survive. So what all can you do? What can all of us do to really help our communities? Well, the first is this, and, and we can't say this enough at Retail Strategies, um, that cities and economic development agencies, property owners need to plan now for the recovery and the rebuild. So what does that mean? How can you plan now? Well, certainly trimming expenses, finding out what type of funding is available. Um, if you are a landlord, considering short-term leases or reimagining your space, um, subdividing your large space into more smaller parcels for entrepreneurs, as we grapple with the fact that consumer confidence is going to be down. Also, supporting downtown is probably one of our top recommendations. And many will say, well, gosh, you know, our city budget is, is less than we thought it was going to be. How are we going to have money to support our downtown or to spruce up, um, you know, our, our town centers? Well, what we're seeing successful cities do now is, again, reimagine those public spaces. So, for example, where a, a row of parallel parking might have been um, on the edge of the roadway in the downtown, can you put a street deck up and fence in that area and have a temporary outdoor dining area so that your restaurants who are struggling at minimum capacity can expand their capacity outdoors? Again, a place where consumers are a lot more confident. Um, we have a lot of ideas and solutions about that. If you do have questions about how you can really help your downtown, be sure to reach out to us. I actually just did a webinar earlier today about that. Um, also, you can be a connector for small businesses and other eligible entities to funding. You know, uh, we do this every single day at Retail Strategies. We're trying to provide resources for community partners and help people understand what's available. We take it for granted that many people understand what is available. But the fact of the matter is that many small business owners are completely overwhelmed. They're trying to keep their business open. They don't know what to do or where to turn. And so they are seeking information like the information that we presented today. So we would encourage you to share that with them. Additionally, recognize that opportunities are typically born out of crisis. And this can kind of be a difficult thing to talk about sometimes. We certainly don't want to make light of the tragedy and really the widespread devastation that people are experiencing with loss of life and jobs and property. However, um, the, the you know business does go on. And, and what we're learning in the national retail world is that some businesses who are well capitalized and who were not carrying a tremendous amount of debt from the previous recession of 2008 are looking to expand right now. Um, businesses, restaurants with drive throughs are winning. Um, and so we're seeing businesses like Canera Bread and Chipotle, Shake Shack that are um, requiring all of their existing real estate to be retrofit with drive throughs and pickup lanes. And so we're going to see a permanent shift in the market as it relates to that type of behavior. Also, certain businesses, certain fitness users, and Harbor Freight is another brand that is looking to expand. So where you might have a business like a Goodies or a Stage um, that has just announced that they're going to be closing all of their stores, while you might have a vacancy, um, just know that there are some businesses that are looking to get into markets that they previously weren't able to because of a lack of real estate. Um, so it, while it is um, uncertain for many communities, we do want to let you know that we're hearing that businesses are expanding and it's not all doom and gloom. Um, understanding your real estate is really the best thing that you can do to be prepared for those opportunities. Start now developing a robust digital presence. You know, we've learned that on a, a nationwide basis that almost 70% of small businesses did not have an online sales component before COVID-19. So it's extremely hard for them to reach their customers without that all that infrastructure already in place. So we are working with our downtown partners, with our municipal partners, to help their main street businesses and their small businesses get online. Um, that's more important than ever. And then finally, monitor Congress, because we know that further aid will be forthcoming. Uh, we just don't know when. So what's next for Congress? Well, there, is a, there was a, a lot of agreement early on for the CARES Act. Uh, members of both political parties knew 
that something had to be done and that businesses needed help. Um, this fourth phase, there is not so much agreement and there is really a lot of contention. Um, some don't believe that there needs to be a fourth phase. Many believe that we just need to kind of wait and see what's needed. Um, Republicans are very concerned with the amount of national debt being incurred. And Democrats are feeling pressure to deliver aid to municipalities and states that are hurting, such as New York. Infrastructure elections and further direct aid to Americans and those in poverty have been discussed. Um, broadly speaking, as we've said a couple of times today, the CARES Act is a relief package. We know that much more is needed. So we're going to be watching this. And when there is a fourth phase of funding, we'll be right here to help you guys unpack that and find out what's available for you. So now let's take a moment to look at the questions that have been asked. And if you do have any additional questions, feel free to drop those right now. Um, as a reminder, we will be sending out this recording of the webinar and the slide deck. Um, so don't worry, you'll be receiving all this information. So now for our first question, um, can CARES Act funds be used for public safety infrastructure? And if so, are they accessed through the state? Yes, they can be used for public safety infrastructure. That's a great question. However, if your community is less than that population of 500,000, which probably all of us are here today, then you would definitely need to communicate with your state. So um, we would recommend communicating with your state legislature um, to see what discussions they have had about trickling down um, their portion of that $150 billion that is going directly to states. Um, that is an eligible expense. It can't have been budgeted for um, in your budget. So if it's a new expense that you're wanting to implement, then it is eligible, and we would definitely encourage you to talk to your legislators to help you understand um, how they are going to be trickling that, that money down if they will. Next question is about um, the direct payments to Americans. And the question is, what about students who are 17 years old who are not claimed on their parents' tax return and have their own tax returns? Then yes, as far as I know, they are eligible. In fact, I talked with a cosmetologist here in Mississippi the other day, she is um, 19, is not claimed on her parents' tax returns and files her own taxes. Um, she has been told by the IRS that she is eligible. However, um, she had not filed taxes until 2019. And because of that, even though she filed them prior to the CARES Act being passed, um, as I mentioned earlier, those 2019 tax uh, returns are having to be processed. And so there is a little bit of a backlog for those who have just filed taxes for the first time in 2019. But yes, if, if this individual, this student is 17 and, and files taxes on his or her own, then as far as we know, they are eligible. Next question is, where do I go to learn more about the farmer's market fund? Great question would definitely um, encourage you to reach out to the Department of Ag in Arkansas, if that's where you're coming from. If not, wherever your state is, contact the Department of Ag and ask them what is specifically available through the CARES Act for farmers. Now, to clarify a little bit, that money will go directly to your farmers and not directly to the farmer's market, but it is our intention and, and kind of what we're recommending to, to um, directors of farmers markets is to find out what the money is to be used for, who is eligible for it, and go to your farmer with a proposal and basically say, that our understanding that this money is available for you since you sell to the farmers market. Can you expand your offering? Can you start doing online ordering and deliver at the market for those that don't feel comfortable shopping and things of that nature. So just find out what's available through the Department of Ag and, and connect with your farmers. Um, next question, is the $600 federal unemployment prorated for those that didn't work 40 hours? No, everybody that qualifies for unemployment um, will receive uh, the $600 per week. What is prorated is their state compensation. So, you know, here in Mississippi, I think there's a maximum of about $300, $350 or so per week that the state will pay in unemployment. Um, 
that portion is prorated depending on um, what the individual did, how many hours they worked, but the $600 um, is guaranteed per week um, until December 31st or until the individual becomes employed again. And then the last question that we have is, can employers that open threaten their employees that they can get their unemployment stopped if they don't come back to work? No, not necessarily. So basically, it is an open market, so the employees can choose whether or not they work for the small business or whether or not they collect unemployment. Um, it is a sticky situation. What we are really encouraging small businesses to do is just to kind of form relationships with their employees um, and try to encourage them to stay, give them as many hours as possible. Um, but there's really nothing that small businesses can do to um, to stop those collecting unemployment. However, you can't double dip. So someone filing for unemployment can't still be working um, for the small business, of course. Um, they have to choose. And we just had another question come in. Has there been any news regarding how PUA system be down? How is it impacting those who have applied as far as when they will get their approval? Um, I'm assuming the PUA is, is the you know personnel unemployment or, or basically you're talking about the unemployment firm. And I have not heard anything about that specifically, Mindy. I'm sorry. I don't know anything about the, the system being down. I do know, however, that many states are completely overwhelmed. Um, and so it's just they, their staff is working literally 24 hours a day. Um, you know, they have shifts working 24 hours a day, I should, I should say, instead. Um, and that many of the um, help phone lines are not, um, you know, people can't get through. So what we're recommending is that people just keep calling, um, keep trying, um, but the money, you know, hasn't run out, it's just backlog. And we did have another question actually that just came through, which is great, you guys keep the questions coming. Can someone draw partial unemployment benefits and still receive the 600, the full $600 from the CARES Act? Yes, um, basically when you apply for unemployment, they will determine what you are eligible for, that you are eligible for the $600 per week. Everybody is eligible for that. And then the only prorated portion um, is the state portion. And so they will determine based on your hours or you know your past employment history, really whatever their criteria is, they will determine um, you know, their share. But those, those will be combined. The state share and the $600 from the federal unemployment will be combined and you'll receive one check also, um, it will go back to March, I think it's 20th or somewhere right about then. So if you apply today, you know, in, in, in May, you, once you're approved, um, you would receive funding all the way, going all the way back to March, you know, mid-March basically, and then you'd start getting your weekly payments thereafter. Now, there, not everybody is being approved, um, and so that is, is certainly up to your state's um, employment services office, um, especially those that are self-employed. Um, we've heard of realtors that have employed, uh, applied for unemployment and have been denied because, you know, their payment is really, they are 1099 employees, but um, their payment is really considered a commission, so there's been some some differing um, feedback we've gotten there. So not everybody will be approved, but then also talk to an individual who is a, a contract employee. She's a consultant, basically, a 1099 employee um, in the educational industry, and she was approved for full benefit. So it's a pretty easy application online. Um, if you know people that are hurting, that are unemployed, that are, you know, financially vulnerable, that's what this funding is for. So we definitely encourage them to apply through their state unemployment services office. Um, but also to be mindful that small businesses need employees. And so it is a fine line and a balance. We want people to be employed. That helps the economy. That helps businesses. Um, that helps all of us. So that's essentially the ultimate goal. Um, but for those who are, are really um, financially vulnerable, that, that unemployment benefit is there. Um, so that really wraps up 
our, uh, our webinar here today, as far as my portion of it, I um, really want to thank all of you for tuning in, and I really want to thank Shelby um, for having us today in the center um, at Central Arkansas. You guys are a true leader in economic development um, throughout the state and throughout the country, and so keep doing the great work that you're doing. Um, we appreciate the partnership, and if any of you have questions about um, the retail industry and your community, um, we're always happy to do a gap analysis to show where your retail leakage is and to help you understand your downtown, we'd be happy to do a complimentary walkability assessment as well. So reach out to us um, if you're interested in any of that, and we will be sending you an email, as Shelby mentioned, tomorrow with all of the resources from today's webinar. So that does it for me. I'm gonna kick it back over to Shelby to wrap us up today. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, and I just wanna reiterate what you said about thanking everybody for joining us today. Um, we had a really great active audience and we really appreciate the questions that you all had um, that helped enhance our conversation. Um, Jen, I want to thank you also in Retail Strategies for quote unquote joining us in Arkansas. <laughs> not not really being here, but um, joining, <laughs> joining our audience of, of our Arkansans. Um, Retail Strategies is also a Community Development Institute speaker um, and you guys are going to be joining us at CDI 2020. Um, CDI is our community and economic development training program that we've hosted the past 34 years. Um, and I just encourage our audience, there's still time to join. If you want to learn more, you can go to www.uca.edu slash CDI. Um, I wanted everybody to know that our staff is always here and available for questions. You can reach out to me personally um, at 501-450-5269. If you go to our website, my contact information is on there. Um, our team at UCA is always available for assistance in any training and um, even technical assistance projects you might have. Um, thank you guys for joining us, and I think that's it. We wrapped up right almost at the hour. We're only a couple of minutes past. <laughs>